Welcome to the best hour of their day podcast with your hosts, Jason Fernandez and me, Jason Ackerman. With more than 20 years in the business, as both coaches and affiliate owners, our passion is to help create world-class affiliates and coaches by building better boxes. Welcome to the best hour of your day. Fern, you and I say a lot of outrageous things. No, you say, you say a lot of outrageous things. You say some, well, okay, let me rephrase it. I say outrageous things. You say like racist things. That's definitely not true. <laughs> that's, not, that's not even close to being true. I was telling I was telling our you know friend Anasan this morning because he commented on one of the memes. The one I made that meme of um, the car sound and I said, shut off the best hour podcast. Like I made oh, yeah. that ourselves. Right. And I think a lot of it is like when you make fun of yourselves, you you're, you're you have a lot more room to make fun of other people and not get canceled because you're just like. I'm part of this thing. Like I'm in it. Well, I am. Yeah. Like I just am a big fan of giving canceling people. people. No, I think canceling people is dumb. I just like, I'm a big fan of just making fun of things, all things, all things, all people just because it's funny. Um, and you can do that without being malicious. So this idea that you can't make fun of things is just stupid. Again, I think um, a lot of that stems from our, uh, childhood being in a boy's locker room in middle school not as an adult being in a boy's locker room as an adult you're in the boy's locker room no it's weird as an adult that's what i'm saying so i'm not saying out of context people don't i don't want to see the the quotes of jay likes being in boys locker rooms no but when you're a kid growing up in middle school high school i'm sure it's the same for basketball but wrestling man your best friends were like the harshest on you Oh, and man. being on sports teams in general was a, just a relentless onslaught of just being ridiculed. Hey, do you do girls experience that in like the high school? I feel like girls are like, just like ruthless guys are busting balls, but like, we're girls not trying mean. to make each other cry. Are, like girls yeah. are trying to hurt each other. Girls right. Are mean girls are mean. Yeah. Katie, what's the meanest <laughs> thing a girl on your track team said to you? You'll be, yeah. this is what they said. You'll never amount to anything. You'll be working for the best hour company one <laughs> You'll day. Never amount to anything. <laughs> Still, the meanest thing anybody's ever told me is that uh, I'm the most awkward mover they've ever seen. And that was you. Mm, so. That was definitely <laughs> not somebody on the track team. Um, it was you. Yeah. yeah. Spoken Did I say that? My secret weapon. Is, it's my secret yeah. weapon. I'm, yeah. I'm unassuming. Well, funny guess what, that, Katie? Funny part was that came from somebody who has zero athletic ability in their body. So, <laughs> yeah. But the good news is we are going to see Chris Hinshaw in person. So by the time people are listening to this, right, we will have already done that and fixed you up. Fix me up. And I get to triple jump against you. I'm excited. Are we, wait, uh, what happened? I don't want to. If we're going hammy. to a track, we're going to triple jump. <laughs> I will hurt myself. I'm too, I'm too old. That's to why we're that. doing it. Yeah. <laughs> I was, uh, exactly I took Madison right to the playground the other, this is just yesterday. I took her to the playground and these kids are, do you know how you like get the swing going and they jump off? So I'm like walking in they're like, Hey, can you do this? I was like, I'm 43, kid. Like, what do you mean? Can I do this? He I couldn't do it. You were a kid. Yeah, he did. He literally thought I was a kid. Who's being this small, little tiny bearded kid. Yeah, being small makes people think you're a kid longer. But anyway, we say a lot of outrageous things. One thing we say that is not outrageous, but it's taken the wrong way is, hey, if you show up to coach my class or a class for me at Rife, at Best Hour, at Katie, what's the name of the affiliate again in Georgia? CrossFit Dunwoody that I'm at. That's right. CrossFit Dunwoody. 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 Uh, you better show up with a lesson plan. Why? It, it to me is the absolute bare minimum you need to do to be a coach here. Like if, and, and here's the deal. I know many people are cap NC, mayhem, all the other. And I know they give you a lot of assets these days. They give you kind of the layout for 60 minutes. Look at it. Sure. You want to print that out. Cool. But you need to put your own notes in there as well. Cause those are not perfect. And yeah. also. Yeah, go ahead. And, and you, and you know, your members better than, than they do. So maybe you have a common fault that you want to address in any given workout, but also even if it's just a read through it and check to make sure, you know, it like don't make changes for the sake of making changes. However, show up with that lesson plan and, you know, put some posts up, not, too, too far back, you know, about showing, you know, a drop dead start time. And then also the big one that I said is I think just start your class on time. If your class starts at four, don't wait till 401, 402. And 
Th- that drives me crazy. Hey, we're waiting for all the late people. Hey, how about you take care of the people that showed up on time? Yeah, I mean, you've definitely beaten that horse to death with regard to not punishing the people that are showing up on time. But you're right. Um, so, well, because regard- at this point in life, like it's effort for me to make it to the box on like something I never appreciated as the box owner or coach in the past, where it's like you have a kid. I mean, I'm speaking to the choir with you, Fern, but like it's fucking. Just leaving the house is hard, Mm -hmm. right? So if I make an effort to be here, start on time. For sure. And I think, uh, I, I, I think it's just, if you're going to consider yourself a coach and and a professional, uh, this is cost of entry, you know? So, um, if you, I mean, if you think about sports teams, so there, you're not going to find a basketball coach, a baseball coach or football coach at the high school or, or college level. That's not showing up with an outline for the practice. Like we know what we're doing. We know what drills we're going to run. We know what defensive schemes we're going to work on. We know, are we going to scrimmage or not? Like we're like, we know if we're having conditioning on the back end of that, Like you know, all of those things, like nobody's walking out there be like, Hey guys, let's, uh, um, I don't know. Should we put helmets on today? Should we, should, how do we No, That's not how any of that works. And, and if, again, if particularly if you're an affiliate owner and if you are a head coach, you know, if you're anybody, that's coaching. You should do your best to do this. I think there's a little bit of wiggle room in there for people who are kind of doing it part-time and, and, and really just trying to make, you know, just trying to get into this and don't have a ton of time, but uh, let me ask you that then where do you draw the line? You know, you, you have three full-timers on the CrossFit Rife staff. Mm -hmm. Do they have different expectations? Lindsay, Cassidy, and Jared, that is than your part-time coaches when it comes to showing up prepared. No, no, everybody's supposed to be show up prepared. Um, but the, my expectation for those folks is that they perform at a higher level. Um, not, not to say that I don't expect a lot from my part-timers. I absolutely do. They're, and they're great and they're good. Um, but it, it's just real. It's, it's realistic to expect that my coaches that are getting more hours on the, on the floor that are doing this full time, that are giving feedback would be more proficient at the skill set. Like, that's just, that's just the reality, but everybody's expected to show up and be ready to go. And it's obvious if you don't. Well, and, and I would say like, look, I don't, I don't know Jared as well as I know Lindsay and Cassidy, if they <laughs> showed up to coach a class that I was attending with zero preparation, I'm pretty confident it's still going to be an above average class. Cause they've got hours. I mean, thousands of hours coaching they've, coached strangers at level two is around mm-hmm. the world. Like I'm not worried about them. So people that are listening there, they may be thinking, well, I'm a part-timer. I don't have the time. Like because you're a part-timer, it's even more vital, even more important for you because you just don't have the experience that these well, guys do. You can in air quotes, get away with less prep. If it's, if this is what you do for a living. And we've talked about this a little bit, but that doesn't mean it, like the degree you know, like we'll use some level, some level one, um, verbiage, you know, when we talk about, um, intensity and functional movements, and it's like the needs of the Olympic athletes and our grandparents don't differ by kind. They differ by degree. The need of our novice coaches and our experienced coaches don't differ by kind. They differ by degree. So the degree with you to which you prep for a a class via a lesson plan or any sort of logistics, obviously has some variance with regard to how much time you have on the floor. If you have 10,000 hours on the floor, I don't think the expectation is that you're going to spend 45 minutes writing a lesson plan for a 60 minute class, because you just have a lot of knowledge banked in your mind. You could write one out on command, but like sitting down and writing it and doing all of those things is probably not going to be required because of the number of reps that you have available to you you know, in small, large group, you know, individual training. So I think that's, what's important with regard to this is like, it doesn't differ by kind, like you, you still need a lesson plan, but it does differ by degree. So, you know, depending on where you're at, you can just make the obvious assumption here on the degree with which you should be planning with a class. And if you were, if you're somebody that has, and here's how I would phrase it. If, if somebody's going to walk into your class and evaluate it, what would be your level of stress with regard to executing a lesson plan? Like, could you write it on command and then execute it as it was written? Or would you be like, I'm freaking out right now. N- none of this will probably play out the way that it should be. Um, and I-, I think that would be a good litmus test. I don't think you should do that, but that, that would probably l- guide you 
a little bit more with regard to like where you should go. Like if you came in and said, here's the workout, write a lesson plan. I could do that in 10 minutes and I, I could execute it within one to three minutes on the timeline, depending on what was going on in there. And I have high confidence level in that. And, and that just comes from experience. And, and part of that experience is when you look at a, any given workout, you see the movements and there's not one movement that you've not coached dozens, if not hundreds of times. So the, the newer coach, we got power cleans today quickly. I'm just like, cool, deadlift, deadlift, shrug, you know, muscle clean, you know, lots of variations there, but I've done it so many times that it's just like, okay, what do I want to see? And it's more about just the, the time of the class. Like what's the workout I need to start by this time. Let's work backwards. And I'm doing this all in my head and probably 30 seconds or less, no different than you. Right. So, and here's why I think this is important. So I pulled up cap um, cause I have access to cap. So with regard to the lesson planning, obviously you've got your major components of your um, lesson plan. So, so let's, let's break it down. Did you want to do that? Or you want me to do it? <laughs> Either one of us. Can okay. Do it. So but if you got, look at a lesson four, plan, you've got four major components. I've got the kind of whiteboard brief, the warm up, which includes both general and specific, the wad, and then your cool down. Um, there's other little tiny nuanced things in there. Um, but I want to, I want to speak specifically to coaches who are getting lesson plans from elsewhere. And I want to emphasize why they should still be digging into that. And, and the reason for that are, are, there's quite a few. So number one, you have to look at the, the workout. So let's just look at whiteboard brief and warmups for, for, for the purposes of this conversation. So the first thing you have to look at is, is this workout that I've received from whoever you get it, let's say you're using cap. Um, is that something that I could facilitate in my facility? So like, just, is it period. feasible? Just period. Like, period. can we execute this workout? Yes. Whether or no. it's bikes, you know, typically you're right. looking at the, right. The equipment list, like, right. okay, they have bikes or they have running and it's snowing out. I mean, rarely does it have to do with barbells or right. you know, medicine balls, et cetera. Right. So perfect example of this. Uh, this is actually, I don't know what workout this. This is today's workout. So it's, uh, it's, is uh, five rounds of, uh, 20 pull-ups and 400 meter run monostructural gymnastics, nothing crazy. Most CrossFit gyms could do that. Cool. Don't see a ton of reason to maybe do any scaling there unless running is not available to you. If you in the, in Antarctica or like it's snow and it's in December in the Northeast. Okay. Well, running is probably not in the card. So I need to you, look at that. Let me give you a tangent here. What would you do there? Cause I think that's a big, that's a mistake. A lot of boxes, maybe not even a mistake, but I think it's something boxes come up with. Like we had Nicole um, last week at the affiliate, which is almost an identical workout, right? 20 minutes of, Running and pull-ups, basically. Depends. Depends on your skill level with pull-ups. Could be an entirely different workout if you're good at pull-ups. Yeah, but I mean, same two movements over 20 minutes, etc. And it was terrible weather out here. So, but whether you row, bike, double under, like that, definitely impacts the workout. So for, right. So now, but again, this also, again, this is the point of looking at it and, and taking in context with regard to your gym and your facility. So but I'm asking, what, what, what's your go-to? Like if you know, you're in Virginia, so you can run pretty much year round, but if you couldn't, it depends for this workout specifically, I would not pair it with rowing. Right. Cause your grip is just fried. Well, I, it's just a lot of pull-ups and then there's more pulling. So it's just pulling for 20 minutes, which gives me a little bit of concern with regard to rhabdos, doms, like all that. It's just pull, 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 pull for 20 minutes nonstop. So Nicole, red is, flag. Nicole is definitely one of those classic girl workouts that when Coach Glassman made in the early 2000s, he had no idea the fitness. Yeah, yeah. No, if you look at that now, you're like, that's a, that's a, you know, in air quotes, it's a dumb workout. But I, don't I was think surprised it was programmed, to be honest, because I skipped it. Like full disclosure, I know I'm going to sound like arrogant here, but I'm too good at pull-ups to do Nicole because it will fuck me up for a week. Like so I would get 200 reps and that's just too much. Like, so unless you're I, get, purpose you're not getting 200 kit. Uh, don't here, try to yeah. make me get rhabdo right now. I Listen, will easily, you, get 200 I reps. would be willing to bet large sums of cryptocurrency to Bitcoin, suggest that you will not get 200 pull-ups. The reason I know that is, um, we can do this in, in national. A, I feel a, like I'm a, I'm better at pull-ups than you. That's not uh, true. That is well. That's here's the here's here's most what I do. Ludicrous Dustin, thing you've ever said. Dustin Virgil is definitely better at pull-ups than you are. Yes, Dustin is way fitter than I am. I will give you that. But he's a big dude. I bet you I can get more pull-ups than him. What's the highest you've ever gotten? 
I've gotten enough that I couldn't extend my arms. I don't know what that number was. I don't remember. That could remember. be four. You're not fit. It might have been like in the that. low in the right. low low teens. Yeah. No, so it was. I when mean, we did this a couple of years ago for uh, this is a few years ago actually at this point for what, for Tasha's for Tasha's thing. thing yeah. yeah, I got really bad rabdo. And that's what I'm and, saying. Whether and, it's 200 Dustin, or not, you will get Dustin, rabdo. Dustin beat me by like two reps. I had 192 and he had 194. That means the first two sets you're going 50. Just that's like that's like you have given. to. Yeah. You're doing and 50 unbroken. For reference, so, Dustin Virgil. Former, he did he ever make the games? He was definitely no, a high he, regional he definitely athlete. Regionals. He's, he's, a, he's still very fit, dude. He's very much fit. fitter than I am. Awesome, dude. Judges with us every year. One of the, my favorite people to see every year at the games. But the point of all of that is so I, you know, now I don't know that I would program that workout. Uh, for most people, it's self regulating. As you get a little bit further into your CrossFit career, it can be a little bit more problematic, but there's ways to work around that. Like don't wear grips, don't, don't do things that would facilitate you, facilitate you staying on the bar longer. Oh, strict like, pull-ups. Like, strict pull-ups, something of that nature. So anyway, now what I would not pair that with is rowing because I don't want to have more and more and more eccentric loading at the elbow so that you can't extend your arms for weeks on end. Right? Imagine that, so, like you would literally have to walk around with your elbows bent at 90 degrees. It was the most excruciating uh, rhabdo I've ever had in my life. Like it was really, really, really bad. How many times um, have you had rhabdo? Probably three. But you weren't hospitalized. You just know. I, this one, I probably should have been. I mean, it was in, I was in severe. I couldn't put my hands over my head. I could not extend my elbows for weeks. And it took me like two months to be able to do a pull-up again. It was bad. What did you do to recover from that? Just suck it up. Yeah, I mean, there's not there's nothing to do like there, well, you, I mean, know, you know hydrate like IV, hydrate, hydrate like there, yeah. you know there's nothing there's nothing you can't do but did anyway. you were you peeing like dark no um right. so that that can't that does happen but it's it's not um it's not as frequent or as uh common right. um in in um like fitness induced rhabdo uh those are more like in crushing injuries although it yeah. does happen but anyway i don't get our rhabdo uh rabbit hole but the uh rhabdo hole the um so I would pair it with, I'd, I'd probably go with a bike for this one. It mimics running a little bit more um, with regard to the movement pattern than rowing does. Mm -hmm. So that's what I would do. Um, if Obviously, if you've got runners and you can't run outside, that's another option. Um, so, but the, where I was going with all of this is you want to look at these lesson plans because um, there might be things in the lesson plan, either the workout needs to change or, or in the specific teaching points that you may need to change because you either cannot do it or your skill set is not there. So for instance, this one in the, uh, in the warm up has a butterfly pull-up progression. So the reason I bring this up is not that butterfly pull-up progression is bad, but if you've never done a butterfly pull-up progression and you don't know how to coach the butterfly pull-up, that's going to have to get sorted out prior to you walking out in front of the whiteboard, maybe you're just adept at running the level one progression, you know, the kip swing, the kip swing, plus the kip, you know, the kip swing, plus the pull up, you know, the push away, like all that kind of stuff. And that's where you're at. And, or maybe you don't, or you look at your class and you don't have anybody that can do a butterfly pull up. Okay. So then that doesn't make sense anymore. Not that this is a bad piece of, uh, of information or content in the lesson plan is totally appropriate for this workout. If I had uh, a demographic of athletes that could execute the butterfly pull-up and it felt appropriate for me to teach in combination with me being able to teach it. So this is a perfect example of taking a well-written lesson plan and I would need to modify that lesson plan to both my skill set and the athletes that are walking in the gym. And this is, we haven't even got to the workout yet. This is just the specific warm-up. So again, the lesson plan, it, it's an outline. It's not gospel. And I, this is where I feel a lot of people run into issues with regard to the lesson plan is like, it doesn't matter where you get it from. You still need to dissect it and figure out, okay, I'm going to have time to do that. I'm not going to have time to do this. Maybe the logistics with regard to some of these lesson plans don't match what you've got going on at your gym. Maybe you have, you know, a ton of athletes and the logistics for some of this is, is doesn't pan out for you. I'll, I'll and, go a level deeper too. Like what if you're just not capable as a coach at that level yet to coach the butterfly pull-up. Well, that's what I said earlier. Like maybe you just, maybe you just could literally not do that. Like you, you couldn't demo it. There's nobody that could demo it. You're not, your eyeballs are not good enough at looking at it to coach it. If in fact it was going wrong, what would the cues be? How would I do that? So right back where I started, which is you should not roll that out if you've never done it before 
like real time in the middle of the class is not the time to run something for the first time. And by the way, it's not going to go well. Nothing wrong with that. If you're not at the level where you can demo or see it or any of that. That's my whole point. It's not good or bad. It just is. And I need rather that. Yeah, I would rather you be like, hey, I can't teach that. I'm just going to teach the regular kip and pull up. And then if somebody does have a butterfly, I'll do my best to sort that out. But I'm not going to roll out a progression that I can't teach, I can't do, and I can't see. Because it it would just be, it would be a disaster. So I'll give you a real world example on this. And I, I'm not going to use names, but Nicole was programmed and somebody, I saw somebody post about, well, we did three by 10 bench before Nicole, just in case, just so you guys know. And I was like, okay, a doing bench before an extremely high rep volume of pull-ups is probably not ideal. But more so what that shows me is because in Nicole's lesson plan, there was work on the kipping pull up for 10 to 15 minutes, I think. Mm -hmm. And it was like that just showed me you were not comfortable coaching the kipping pull up. So you threw in more work. Right. So, again, all going back to the reason for the lesson plan you know, as stated at the level one and the level two is to maximize your efficiency with regard to coaching athletes or in better terms, improving movement inside the class. Um, so I need to design it that way. And there's nothing wrong with, if you get a lesson plan and you don't understand it, or you don't feel like your skill set is appropriate, or you don't have the confidence level in it. That is exactly what we're saying. Change it, write your own lesson plan that you feel comfortable executing. And then I measure my success. Maybe I change, maybe I swap out that 12 minutes in this particular lesson plan from cap of work there with 12 minutes of just working on the regular kipping pull-up and then working on, uh, you know, any number of different progressions. So it's got, you know, pu- uh, butterfly pull-up progression, seven minutes. Um, it's total is 12. So, yeah, I mean, I don't, and I'm not time to look record, through the whole thing, but the, the, uh, people just that the, have cap can go back and look at what you're looking yeah, at. Yeah. So this is for April 4th. So Monday, April 4th, this is the lesson plan for that day. Uh, yeah. For people that have cap, you can look at it. So, um, but that's, that's really understanding the value of the lesson plan. And this is the, the idea of there's a, it's either like a wartime general or, or, a, or a president. Maybe it's just like the value is not in the plan. It's in the planning. Yeah. So when you're writing the lesson plan, the value is not in this, you know, super clean timeline that is pretty to look at. The value is in me understanding where the, where the wiggle room is. If I was going to buy time, where would I get it from? If I had to cut something out of the lesson plan, what would it in fact be? And all of those things are predetermined. So if you do break out of the specific warm up, or you break out of the, let's use this one. Let's say if you break out of the, um, the whiteboard brief at seven minutes, and this was allotted for four, what do you do? What, what's, what is the immediate action at this point? Right. So this is in the, in the military, they call these emergency action plans or not in the military, but that's where they stole from. It's emergency action plan. What is my emergency action plan? If I break the whiteboard three minutes late, where am I stealing that time from? And it's not just continue on with, with the predetermined timeline. You can't yeah, because now it's, it's three six, minutes off. Yeah. Cause it's a 63 minute it, class now, which it doesn't is not what it was seem like for. much, but that's 5% of your class. I mean, I don't do math, but you're probably Katie, wrong. Double check yeah. that. I think that's yeah. accurate. Yeah. And and in, in, in addition to that, here's something else. Like you've said this numerous times. This is not a memory test. If you want to have that lesson plan, write it on the whiteboard. If you want carry it on a piece of paper, it's not a memory test. It's like, it, it's like using, you know, a uh, Google maps, right? I don't look at it and shut it off and try to make sure I remember it. I use it for every step of the way along the drive. And your lesson plan can be the, the very same. Do you remember map quest? I remember that I was going to go there, but I was you would afraid print, you would print out 47 pages yeah. of stuff. You're like, all right, we can throw that one away. I was so afraid your lesson plan is like, wouldn't understand that. Yeah. It's okay to print out your, your map quest for your class. It's fine. Um, so, and again, that is, that is where the value of the lesson plan comes in. Um, and I think with regard to the lesson plan, I, I think people, they're like, it's there, it exists. And I think that's a mistake. I think a lot of people are like, well, we get lessons plans from so-and-so and I'm like, I don't care where you get it from, but the point is, is like, can you do that? And if not, what are you doing with it? Because if I take the lesson plan and I, and I execute on it, well, this is valuable to me now, both myself and the, the class. 
like I can, I can give my self assessment on, Hey, I need to clean up that whiteboard brief or the specific warm up was long or, Oh, I've misjudged the transitions because, um, the equipment was not staged. So I was only allotting for 60 seconds and I was took three minutes and now I have to steal two minutes from somewhere. Well, so- and I want to say this, like that shit doesn't happen accidentally either. You know, if the, if the whiteboard brief in this lesson plan is meant to be delivered in four minutes and you never practice your whiteboard brief, you're, you're not, you're going to look like we talk about on level one staff finishing early is no different than finishing late. It's still a, miss on the timeline and not that you should just talk for the sake of talking in front of the whiteboard. But if, if, if your whiteboard brief is going significantly less than three minutes, I would argue you probably didn't cover everything. There are instances where it will be significantly less than that. So depending I would, on the movement and the work, I would argue right? this would be one where like you could get a ton of information thoroughly distributed in two minutes and break out of there and probably throw a couple jokes in there. And I know that sounds fast, but it's not if you have a framework and then you're like, Hey, there's one thing I want people to walk away from with regard do it, to do it. You know? I, don't, I, I agree with you. I know you can do it, but I want to hear, but let's let the listeners hear you do it in real time. Okay. Set the clock, cool. Katie. Make sure. No, he's got his watch. He's prepared. And Katie's got, what appeared to be. An all right, guys, apple. welcome to CrossFit Rife. It's good to see all of your bright, smiling faces today. Here's what we've got running pull ups. It's going to be five rounds for time. It's going to be 20 pull ups and into a 400 meter run. Okay. So, stimulus for this, for this guys, is for sure probably something in the 20 minute, maybe a little bit less than that. Um, actually, is that right now? So, yeah, it's 16 to 20. So, um, What I want everybody to really focus on today, we need to make sure we get the scaling dialed in for the pull-ups, okay? If you have not done the math on that, that is 100 pull-ups. So if that is out of the question for you, then we need to do some serious scaling with regard to that, okay? So scaling options, if for any reason we're not going to run, today we're going to get on the bike. We're going to go three times the distance, so that'll be 12. If you need to make any modifications on that, please let me know. For the pull-ups, if you've got pull-ups, smoke them if you got them. If we need to make any changes due to injury or you're still working on the pull-up, we've got the adjustable pull-up bars over here. We might do some bands, but I'm not super in love with that. So we'll have that discussion as we get through. But what I want you guys to think about is like somewhere between the three to four minute per round, which we need to look at the run 215 on the long end. So which means I need to get out of the pull-ups and maybe probably two, three sets on the high end. Okay. If you got any injuries I need to address as we go through, please let me know. How long? Minute 18. Yeah. And I think, you know, you delivered that a little faster than you it was probably fast, the board. Right. You, you didn't have any interaction where you would right. have made some jokes, but it easily yeah. dragged that out to two minutes and it would, it would not have felt rushed. But, you know, a couple of things you did well in there. We talk about this a lot is you gave the macro view of like overall time, breaking it down now into time per round, breaking it down into how many sets. Like we know if you're doing more than three sets, you're not going to be at that four minute pace. You know, right. you're just, and then and- the only thing I would have layered in there, maybe like a little bit more, if I had just like, taken more than five seconds to look at that prior to is like put a little bit of strategy on the back end. Yeah. I like that. But, you know, but something else you did well that I think, you know, you, you throw in your sense of humor, you're smoke them if you got them right. Like that's a furnism, if you will, like I get it. It's, but it, it's cool because you should be letting your personality shine through as well as on the whiteboard brief. You know, so the point is like, that would be an example of a four minute brief. There might be a little bit long with regard to what it is I'm trying to, you know, disseminate. Now, if you want to throw in some jokes and you want to do a little bit of, uh, of interaction there, by all means, go ahead and do that. Um, again, that was fast because we literally just like, just do it and do it. But, but therein lies the point, meaning I can expand that to four minutes if need be. But I need to be able to get that information out quickly and concisely, right? So if, if you can if you can do something efficiently, well, then you can drag it out, right? You know, so uh, you, the same analogy would be for running. If you want to run a six-minute mile, well, then you have to run 90-second 400s. Well, if I can run, you know, 60-second 400s, well, then dragging them out to 90 seconds is not an issue. Mm-hmm. That's very easy for me to do. So making it efficient, making it concise allows you the wiggle room to do all of the dancing around with the jokes and interacting with people and doing it and doing whatever you need to and, and putting in more value with regard to, you know, I could look at if uh, I haven't looked at the other thing I might throw in there is like, I would take a look at the previous day's programming with regard to like how much pulling was going on in the previous days. Like if you're sore, 
maybe we should think about scaling back today and maybe use it as a moving day or something along those lines. But also thinking it, about when they're done, right? What what you might have them do, knowing one hundred pull ups may leave people very sore for the next couple of days. Right. So those are all the things that I would look at prior to, and I I want to be able to look at all that stuff and then be able to disseminate the information, but then give the nuggets that are truly valuable, which is like, how is this supposed to go down? And that wasn't even a great whiteboard brief, but with a little, like, I don't know, five minutes of just really chewing on that, I could spruce that up. But the point is, but the point is I want to be able to communicate a couple things, real key points here. You know, if I was to critique my, myself on that, I would spend a little bit more time talking about like, Hey, this is a lot of pull-ups. Like, let's really think about it. It's a hundred. So if you can't do a hundred pull-ups, let's not do a hundred pull-ups. Right. What, what's one way you get that message across? Cause I think that is important. You know, we, there, you have members at your box. We have members at our box that can do a hundred pull-ups, but we also know this is going to fuck you up. I, so that's where I think, um, a lot of, I don't remember when I started really paying attention to this, but, um, really looking at total volume, particularly in workouts like this, where that five, you know, five rounds is as simple as it may sound. What's five times 20? You're like a hundred people overlook that. They're not looking at the total volume when they look at that workout. And that's why you would make a joke and they'd be like, Hey, if a hundred pull-ups sounds like a lot, it's because it is a lot. So if you are doing sets of five, I want everybody to think about how long that's going to take. You're probably outside the 16 to 20 minute time frame If you're going to do five sets of four to get to 20. That's not the way this workout is intended. I'd much prefer you did two big sets of six and six and then get out of there and call it 12. Well, and the other thing you have to factor in there is the running makes it worse because you're going to take a long enough rest that you're coming back relatively fresh. You're right. If you're running, you're keeping your arms bent. I mean, right. I go out the door, I'm like shaking my arms out, but you come back in and you're primarily using your legs. So you come back in and now you're capable of doing more again, where like a workout like Angie, for example, that has a hundred pull-ups off the rip, you would probably scale because you know, after a certain number, you're just staring at a bar. So like to a fault, this allows you to do more, which is of course the workouts that are most likely to deliver rhabdo typically do that. Right. So again, thinking about all of those things and then taking whatever lesson plan I got and then looking at it, you know, uh, knowing that I've got, you know, two people in here that can't pull from overhead due to shoulder injuries, or I've got in this time slot of my 9 a.m., I've got 50% of the class that I'm pretty confident is going to need significant scaling options for any number of reasons. So having all that stuff on the front end and then comparing that with what I know to be likely to unfold in the class, and then lay that over the lesson plan and see if it makes sense. Because if it doesn't make sense, then it doesn't make sense. We're just you know, don't do a kipping, uh, a butterfly kipping pull-up progression in a class that is, you know, mostly your older population, like a 6 PM where most of the people are in there are like coming off nine to five jobs, you know, very little fitness level and are just looking to not get injured. I'm not going to give the butterfly kipping pull-up progression there. I'm going to give another progression. So and this is not bashing this lesson plan. This is a very well thought out and well executed lesson plan. The point is, I don't care where the lesson plan came from. It needs to be modified for your athletes. And this is where I have to look at this and be critical of the entire situation to make sure I'm delivering the best product that I could possibly give when I walk out onto the floor with all of the known variables that are happening inside of my affiliate. Yeah, I think ultimately what we're saying to the listeners, a lot of you want to push CrossFit forward. We want to be a part of what takes us to the next level uh, and, and be a part of what allows other people to see CrossFit and not have the bad stigma or reputation that is sometimes associated with it. And it comes down to coaching and showing up prepared is integral. If you're not, if you're listening to this and you're not willing to do that, we severely ask you, or we ask you to is severely. that severely, yeah, severely ask know. you. It sounds severe. I've, for, for lack of a better uh, vocabulary, <laughs> um, <laughs> words. we ask, check yourself. Like there's a reason if you're not willing to do that, Hey, there's nothing wrong with that. But I, well, I would encourage you to really take a deeper dive into yourself and say, why do I like coaching then? Cause yeah, this is monotonous. This is like the, the tedious stuff, but it's what allows you to deliver a better product to your members. So 
here's where I think we, we can wrap this up. So I know for a fact, James and Austin, they've told us they get a tremendous amount of feedback on cap. You know, people don't like this and they don't like that. So here, here's what I suggest for everybody. A, you should taper your expectations with regard to that product and, and how it should be used because it wasn't written for your affiliate. It's written as a broad GPP program, which is a fantastic resource. You should take ownership of it. And we've talked about this before and you should look at it and you should change it so that it makes the most sense for you and your box. And a best case scenario is you've, it works hundred percent because it happens to work out. Worst case scenario is like that programming is 70% done. Complaining is like, they're never going to give you a product that works perfectly for you because that's literally impossible. So don't have that expectation. Take it as something that's a real time saver and a coach resource and then modify it to your liking. That's what I think people should do. That's how you become a better coach. That's how you provide a better stimulus and coaching for your athletes. And that's how you have people come into the, the walls of your gym and have the best hour of their day. Thanks for checking out this episode of the best hour of their day podcast. We appreciate you listening and choosing to have us help you and your passion for coaching and affiliate ownership. You can find more episodes just like this on all podcast platforms. If you're interested in learning more, you can reach out to us on any social media platforms, or you can visit www.besthouroftheirday.com to book a call. If you found this episode helpful for you, please share it so that we can help other coaches and affiliate owners to help build a bigger and stronger CrossFit community. Thanks for listening.